Our text today is an introduction of John the Baptizer. Now, I'm not going to call him John the Baptist because he wasn't Baptist. He was Jewish. He was an Israelite. Don't go thinking that the Gospels are anti-Semitic. Nearly everyone in the Gospels' stories are Jewish, so it can't be anti-Semitic, right? Sometimes it sounds like it, but it's not. I'm just going to go with the name John in this Bible study. With this introduction of John, Luke is now beginning his gospel. He's aligning it with his source, the Gospel of Mark. As Luke says in Acts 10.37, you know what happened all through Judea. It started in Galilee after John preached about baptism. Now, previously, Luke has told us two stories about births, Jesus and John, and about Jesus' dawning understanding of who he is. But now that he's finished with those birth stories, he picks up from Luke 1, 65 to 66. He says, all through Judea's hill country, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it. And because the Lord was with John, they asked, What then is this child going to be? So now that John is an adult, we find out what he became. He was from a priestly family, the family of the ancestor Aaron. And he was called by God to speak warning and a promise from God to his people, Israel. So Luke starts John's story by describing the political and religious settings for this story. Luke's first readers would have known all about these people, but we don't. So I think I need to explain a little bit about these people. What Luke is doing is similar to if I were to write a story about a setting of the during the time of the Vietnam protests and killing of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. And so you'd understand something about the context, wouldn't you? Like that, Luke is not so interested in the chronology of these things as he is in the narrative of the times the political and religious environment in which all this took place. The Caesar, he mentions, Tiberius, was notorious for throwing the Jews out of Rome. And later in his life, he went insane. He was known for this. We're familiar with Pilate, the governor of Rome, who was in control of Judea. He was the governor who cooperated with Caiaphas to murder Jesus. Herod Antipas was one of the sons of Herod who built the temple and killed the baby boys in Bethlehem. Herod Antipas killed John. Jesus lived most of his life in Galilee under this Herod Antipas because Herod Antipas was the governor of Galilee. We're all familiar with Annas and Caiaphas, at least their names. The high priest's office was for sale by the Romans. So Annas invested in the office of high priest. And then he, after he was his term was finished, he installed his son-in-law, Caiaphas, to be high priest. Now, although Annas was not high priest anymore, he was kind of the godfather of the temple. And so he was still very influential in what happened there. And the Romans allowed a lot of freedom to these high priests to control the population, as long as a lot of disruption didn't take place. And so they are careful about that. 
They wanted to keep their sweet deal with the Romans, so they kept the population under control as much as they could. So, you can see what, with this introduction of John that Luke is setting up the conflict for this story. So, just listen for the setup as I read our text for today, Luke 3, 1 to 6. I'm reading from the New International Version, and I will probably mispronounce some of the names. So here's what it says. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, yeah, I know how to say that, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all God's people will see God's salvation. So now, if you were Herod, Pilate, Annas, and Caiaphas, you would be very wary of this scruffy guy who came shouting out of the desert. He was preaching a, quote, a baptism for the repentance, for the forgiveness of sins, unquote. Well, it doesn't sound terrible, does it? Sounds kind of harmless, doesn't it? Well, perhaps. Unless you remember that according to the law of Moses, forgiveness was only obtained through the temple system which was, of course, the source of wealth and power for Annas and Caiaphas. John was teaching that God's forgiveness was not obtained by temple rituals and sacrifices, but by taking a quick bath in the Jordan River. What? Worse, it wasn't the water that saved you by baptism. It was repentance. Wait, what? What was repentance? The word repent means to turn back, to return to what God thought was right. So what were the people doing that God thought was wrong? What did they need to repent of? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew shows that Jesus was teaching much the same things as John. The right, true righteousness means doing right by God and by other people. It isn't so religious, and it has nothing to do with temple rituals and laws. Yeah, John was a rebel, all right. You better watch out, this guy. So now let's read Luke 3, 7 to 14, it's a sample of what the people needed to repent of. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Whoa, he calls them a brood of vipers? How not to make friends, huh? He's alluding to poisonous snakes that come out of their holes when there's a fire or, or a rainstorm that fills the holes. Poisonous snakes. So what that says is these people were being really terrible to each other, poisonous, in God's sight anyway. As we see in the other Gospels, he may, may have been mostly speaking to the religious rulers, but Luke doesn't think so. He thinks all the people were acting that way. He wanted them to act in love towards each other not like poisonous snakes. It shows that God really cares about us, too. He wants us to also act in love toward everyone else. 
That's righteousness. It's just doing right by God and everyone else. Do the right thing. That's what God wants. John goes on to ask them, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? What is that coming wrath? Well, it's judgment. They believed that if they didn't repent their wicked ways, God would judge them again as he had before. As the prophet Micah wrote, I will strike you down. I will destroy you because you have sinned so much. Now the word of God had come only to John and he knew it. He knew no one else was warning the people as he was doing. So because he was serious about God's judgment, he shouted out his warnings. And what does he tell him? He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Don't just say you've repented and then go home and do nothing. He was warning people against a basic assumption they had for their lives. Do not say to yourselves, we are, have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. They, you know, they all thought that just by being children of their ancestor Abraham, they were under the covenant God had given to Abraham to bless and protect Israel's people. But apparently, not necessarily. It also depended on what they did. John tells them that the fruit of the tree of Israel has gone rotten. Oh, it has produced rotten fruit. So he issues this warning from God. He says, the axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Paul wrote a similar warning in Romans 9, 6 through 7. He says, not everyone in the family line of Israel really belongs to Israel. Not everyone in Abraham's family line is really his child. Now, as a preacher who really cares about his listeners, Luke describes a snippet of John's preaching about what repentance would look like. If we look at the reason for John's teaching, we can understand that this decay had reached all levels of society and what they had been doing to each other. So what should we do then, the crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors who came to be baptized, teacher, they asked, what should we do? Well, don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some of the soldiers asked him, and what should we do? And he said, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. But these things are pretty simple, aren't they? And yet they must have been doing the very opposite or they would, he wouldn't have told them to do this. It all shows that this culture had become selfish and greedy and even violent. Everyone was only concerned for their own prosperity, regardless of what their happiness was doing to everyone else. Apparently, the people's attitudes towards each other had not changed from the time of the prophet Micah, who wrote to them in chapter 6, 8 to 13. The Lord has shown you what is good. He has told you what he requires of you. You must treat people fairly. You must love others faithfully. And you must be very careful to live the way your God wants you to. The Lord is calling out to Jerusalem, and it would be wise to pay attention to him. He says, listen, tribe of Judah. And you people who are gathered in the city, you sinful people, should I forget that you got your treasures by stealing them? You use dishonest measures to cheat others. I placed a curse on that practice. Should I forgive you who use dishonest scales? Do you use weights that weigh heavier than the things are or lighter than they really are? The rich people among you harm others. 
you're always telling lies. You try to fool others by what you say. So I will strike you down. I will destroy you because you have sinned so much. So John is speaking much like Micah did hundreds of years before. So that coming judgment is what John is warning them to escape by repenting. But how does repenting their evil prepare for the coming of the Messiah? Makes no sense, really. And it's because if the people had indeed repented for real, Jesus and John would not have been in such danger. As a result of John's teaching, Jesus was welcomed by large crowds, and so his preparation worked. To that extent, they knew that the teaching of both John and Jesus threatened their personal power and wealth. Who's, who am I talking about there? I'm talking about the ruling elite. They knew that they were in trouble because of this preaching of John. And so they will connive together to kill both John and Jesus. And that's the conflict upon which Luke is going to build his story as we go forward. And that serves as a warning to us of the danger of combining political and religious power. Keep them separated. It also warns us that while in the U.S. we have a right to the pursuit of happiness because of the Declaration of Independence, we also bear the responsibility of its effect on other people. God wants us to live in love towards others as individuals, as nations, and as the whole planet Earth. That's God's will, and that's God's word. We don't live alone. We live in a community of humanity. Now remember that, and do it. And on November 5th, in this country anyway, vote for it. 